In this multidimensional world, much of which is invisible to the eye, a group of non-physical entities have come here to expand our knowledge of how the universe works. These non-physical teachers are called Joshua, and they convey their teachings through Gary Temple Bodley. Each week, Gary, with a selection of Law of Attraction experts, open up a roundtable of thought-provoking discussions surrounding the teachings of Joshua. Joshua's intention is to bring clarity to the listeners through the ever-expanding Law of Attraction by looking at reality from a new perspective. Welcome to the teachings of Joshua Roundtable. Hello everyone, this is episode 19 of the Teachings of Joshua Roundtable. I'm your host, Gary Temple Bodley. Today is February 13th, 2016. Tomorrow is Valentine's Day, so we thought it'd be fun to talk about romantic love. What's the feeling we get when we fall in love? Is there one soulmate for everyone? Or do we have many soulmates? What is the vibration of love? How do we tune our vibration to love? Today we have not one, but three quotes to talk about. They're all about love. We also have a question from Matt who asks about love, soulmates, and the feeling behind being in love. On the round table today, we have Janine Kudakovich. Hi, Janine. Hi, Gary. And Michael Cousin. Hi, Michael. Hey, Gary. And Roman Finitza. Hi, Roman. Hi, Gary. Steve is away on a romantic trip with his wife this weekend, but he'll be back next week. <clears throat> so, Valentine's Day is tomorrow. How are you guys doing? Well, I'm in the I am in the Arctic wasteland known as New York right now. So, you know, it, it'll take romance to warm me up right now. <laughs> Do you have anything planned with your wife? You know what? Actually, it's a three day weekend, and um, I haven't seen my parents for uh, a number of weeks. So we're at, we're going to drive out to uh, see my parents out in deep Suffolk County, New York. Oh, it's always romantic to go see the in-laws on Valentine's. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's what you want to do. Yes, and that's why I'm writing romance novels. <laughs> Not. Janine, <laughs> Janine, are you and Tim doing anything special? We will end up doing something, but we're kind of more roll, roll with the punches. Like, whatever we decide to do that day, we'll just do it. You know, um, I don't have, we don't have any particular plans, but we know we're going to at least do something at night together. So, oh, who knows? You know, sometimes we do. Sometimes we plan things for one another, and sometimes not. I am making a special treat for the whole family. Um, but and then, you know, later in the day, um, you know, towards the evening, Tim and I'll go out and do something fun together. Good. How and about Robert, you? Uh, well, I'm playing poker tomorrow, so sorry, yeah. Lily. <laughs> uh, no, I'm, well, I'm sure you. I'm sure as romantic <laughs> as, a, as a straight flush. <laughs> right. But we'll and go out to dinner tonight. And, yeah, it, uh, and I sent her flowers yesterday at work. Oh, that's beautiful. Oh, oh. I did. I actually got um, two gorgeous flower arrangements yesterday. I only saw one, to be quite honest. And then he's like, "Didn't you see the other one?" And I, I they were absolutely gorgeous, like lilies uh, and pink roses, which he knows I love pink roses. Although red roses are great, you know the pink ones really stand out for me, so I loved uh -huh. them. But um, and so Tim sent you, you two. He okay. uh, he. He did. He did. Wow. Isn't that amazing? And they're yeah. absolutely gorgeous. They are really beautiful. So I, w I was happy to, to have an early Valentine's present because I get to enjoy them that much longer. Cool. What about you, Roman? Um, well, I guess I just kind of recently acquired a girlfriend. So that's cool. Ah, good. Yeah. yeah. Uh, she, wants to, she wants to go out and get pie on, on, on Valentine's Day. So How fun is that? That's I guess, fun. I guess pie is fun. Yeah, we'll go get pie. Awesome. That's great. <laughs> that's great. How long have you been going out? Um, just this week. Wow. I met her last oh. week, so. Cool. Yeah. That's great. Awesome. All right. I, um, I, like the way, I like the way you phrased it as an acquisition. Yeah, it was, <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> and Gary, by, else for. I, I was going to say, Gary, by the way, I'm sure you'll see every bit of Tim tomorrow, because notice I didn't say we'll do anything until tomorrow night, because I'm sure he'll be there playing cards with you. Yeah, good. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, um, so, Jenny, we have three quotes this week. They're all about love. And why don't you read the first one, then we'll talk about, talk about it. Sure. You are loved more than you can imagine, Joshua. So this is Joshua's most um, quoted statement. Um, almost half of the letters people write in ends with, you are loved more than you can imagine, which, <clears throat> which Joshua was talking about, that there are unseen entities, people you're connected with, that 
are around you all the time that love you. And you have this huge support of love that you aren't even aware of. And if you could even glimpse on, on how much you are loved um, in the non-physical, you would just you would never doubt your worthiness ever again. And we don't really feel that as much, but you know, just hearing Joshua say it over and over again to everyone, you just I just picked up on that. Everyone has this cadre surrounding them all the time of love and support. Um, it's so, good to know. Good to know. Yep. Yeah, and in my case, I know it is every day, so I, I appreciate that. Yeah, and it's, I think it's, you know, <clears throat> another thing Joshua says is that you're eternally connected with everyone you know, and if you can think of how many lives you've lived before, connected with all the people you've known in every life, and that adds up, and all those people are in the non-physical focusing on you, because you, in the non-physical, you can focus on, you know, unlimited things all at the same time. So, <clears throat> so while everyone's focusing on you, they're also focusing on everything else at the same time, too. There's a lot of stuff going on. All right, let's go on to the next one. Okay. Love everyone and everything because love feels good, Joshua. So this one talks about um, in physical reality, you are designed to move towards feeling good and away from feeling bad. If you, um, you know, touch your hand to the stove, <clears throat> that feels bad, and pulling it away feels good. So it's a survival instinct thing, instinct thing, but it's also how everything is. If you're hungry, that doesn't feel good, and if you eat, that feels good. So you're designed to understand that you want to move towards whatever feels good and away from whatever feels bad. And love feels good. And the opposite of love is fear, and fear, fear, fear feels bad. So you want to move away from fear towards love. And that's really this whole spectrum is fear is on one end and love is on the other end. And Joshua teaches us to constantly focus on moving towards love. I really like this one because um, I also, too, like when, when uh, Joshua mentioned love feels good and really pronounced that in this quote, I also um, like something I say to my kids all the time is hugs feel good, you know, because I'm all about spreading the love. And so, right. you know, they'll, they'll just come up to me randomly and they'll go, hugs feel good, you know, and give me a big hug. So <laughs> we can go out there and spread hugs, too. Yeah. Uh, while we and hugs our- are love. Yeah, absolutely. It's absolutely. just an expression of it, right? Yeah. Exactly. Oh, no question about it. Yeah. Okay. It, <clears throat> yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. And the next one is. The next one is you cannot lose when you truly love Joshua. And, and this is. Shows, <clears throat> oh, go ahead, Carrie. You can explain yeah. maybe the picture because I love this. <laughs> so this is uh, one that I love too because it is um, a deck of cards or four cards: the seven of hearts, um, the ten of hearts, but just with the zero there, so it looks like O. Oh. The ace of hearts and the three of hearts all upside down, so it spells out love in a heart flush, which is nice. But um, you can't lose when you truly love because if you are acting out of love, then you are aligned with your higher self, the universe, what you really want. Um, And everything that you do and act in that situation can't go wrong only lose when you act out of fear. So when you're acting out of love, whatever happens is for your highest good. So, and that's what that that quote is all about. So we are beings of pure love. And as we act as if that's true, everything starts to work for us. When we try to protect ourselves out of fear, everything goes against what we really want. And so moving towards love again, and that's what that was all about. Yeah, just, just as an aside, Gary, there is a wonderful chapter on love in, uh, in Joshua's book, A Radical Change in Your Approach to Life. You know, everyone should read that. You know, If you're not going to read the entire book, at least that chapter. Yeah, well, everyone needs to read both books, and that's great, good that you put, brought it up, because really the um, first book is sort of the foundation and then a radical change is how to operate within the structure of the foundation that you've read about. Um, 
so it, so it's sort of hard to I mean it's really a cool book because uh, um, a perception of reality you can really go to any page and read a paragraph and it's pretty amazing but if you really go from the beginning to the end of both books you just come away at a much uh, completely different perspective of life of those yeah it, it's really <laughs> remarkable it, it's a great yeah. read absolutely I, I love it too Okay, um, now let's go quickly into this question here. This one comes from Matt, and he just asked it this week, so it was like really apropos. It worked out perfectly. Um, Roman, would you like to go ahead and read as Matt? Sure, yeah, let's read this question. Um, Dear Joshua, one of the overarching desires you hear across the law of attraction circles is most, I'm uh, sorry, is the desire to attract a soulmate. It seems that the main goal or purpose in life for most people is to attract that one person into their life. Once that happens, all of life's problems will be solved. Dating sites make money hand over fist capitalizing on this desire. How do you in the non-physical view romantic love? Is the euphoria you feel in the first few months of an exciting relationship as close as it gets to what you experience in the non-physical, being connected to source? Matt. Yeah, so this is a good question. Um, what is that feeling of love? I mean, that's one of the greatest feelings that there is. I guess another one would be looking into the eyes of a newborn baby, which I've never experienced, <clears throat> you know, of my own baby. But um, certainly I've been in love before, and uh, that initial great, unbelievable feeling is euphoric. That's the best feeling that there is. What do you guys think about that? Well... It's definitely a wonderful feeling. Which one's better, the baby one or the or the romantic love one? They're both wonderful, but they're different. Are they similar or are they different? Well, they're different. Yeah. They're different. You know, one of them is just, you know, one of them is the sense that they're, you know, that you feel this overwhelming generous feeling uh whereas you know, a romantic love has a combination of things. You know, it's the sexual it's the sense that, you know, everything's perfect for this, you know, with this person. But on the other hand, you know, you're also, you know, it's that sense this person is giving that back to you. So it's more reciprocal and, you know, in some sense it's fear-based. Right. So the first one is, more, uh, children one would be more unconditional. Right. And the romantic one, in the beginning, is probably less conditional. And you get more right. conditional as things go along. Um Okay, so let's. <clears throat> yeah, I agree. They're very different, yet they're both euphoric in their own sense. But yeah. for my experience, they're very different. Right. Yeah, spoken as the parents on this panel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. There, uh, there's no way I'm qualified to talk about this. Yeah. <laughs> At least not to your knowledge, Roman. <laughs> oh. Okay, uh, so go ahead, uh, Michael, why don't you go ahead and read the answer from Joshua? You've got it. <clears throat> Dear Matt, while we agree that most humans have a desire to find a mate, we must also point out that a lot of this desire has to do with societal pressures and the, excuse me, and the survival instinct. You are born into a family, and you have a mother and father. Were they soulmates? Most people have an ideal version of love, and that idea revolves around the notion of perfect, lasting, and fulfilling love with one person. This does not match reality. It is an abstraction of the, of the mechanism of physical reality. It is not natural. Okay, so in this first paragraph, um, Joshua is telling Matt specifically that, um, that, that the idea of soulmate isn't really real. It's um, that we sort of grew up, especially in my day, thinking there was one person out there for us, and we had to find that one person. And I think um, a lot of us feel that way. Uh, let's go into the next paragraph and, and see how this plays out. In a natural world, free from the influences of society, you would love all. You would be primarily focused on loving others rather than focused on finding another who will love you. You would not need to be validated by the love of another. All you would care about is expressing your love to others without the need for reciprocation. You are a being of love, and you would not pick and choose who to love, 
you would simply love everyone. Okay, so when Joshua talks about a natural world, he's talking about, they're talking about a world without fear. So in a world without fear, you would just simply love everyone. And some would be romantic and some wouldn't. But <clears throat> you would be primarily focused on expressing your love rather than having someone else validate who you are by loving you. And this is a, a problem with people who are trying to find a relationship is that they want someone to love them rather than wanting to love someone else. And if they went by the approach of, I want to find someone who I can express my love to, whether they reciprocate or not, it just works better within the mechanism of physical reality and the laws of the universe as we know them. Because the first one, finding someone who will love me, is fear-based, and the second one, finding someone who I can love, is love-based. And you just are aligned with the forces of the universe in the second one rather than the first one. Um, let's go on, because this, this question explains more of what we're talking about here rather than us talking about it. Okay. <clears throat> so now you find yourself in a society which demands that you find, some, find one person to love and then refrain from loving anyone else. You are pressured to pick wisely, for there are consequences for making a poor choice. What if you find someone who you love more than the one you've chosen? What if the one you've chosen finds someone they love more than you? Since you only get one choice, you live in fear of making the wrong choice. In a natural world, this fear would not exist. So this is something that I never thought of before. The fear in a relationship comes up when you pick one person and then you're like, oh my God, what if I'm stuck with this person and someone else better comes along? So in the very <laughs> beginning stages, since you only get one, you have to be really choosy and there's so much fear in there. You're like, any little issue that comes up, I'm jumping ship because I can't put all my eggs in one basket. And, you know, I'm sure it's so much less for us now and less for Roman's generation than, you know. But imagine we're watching Downton Abbey, and basically you, you had to pick someone without having sex with them and hope that lasts the you know, lifetime and hope they don't die and hope that you can have children and all that stuff. So it's, it's a lot of pressure back then, but it's still a lot of pressure. And if you make the wrong choice, that's why there's so much fear involved. Um, you had that feeling of euphoria in the very beginning because there's not a lot of investment. You're not, there's, there's little fear because, hey, you just started meeting. If it doesn't work out, it's no big thing. But what if you get involved two years down the road? You know, my, my parents got married because they were the last couple who were, you know, everyone else got married before them. And so they said, well, we're the last couple of our group, so we're going to get married too. And that was just a disastrous um, decision on their part. Worked out good for me, but. <laughs> <laughs> You know, Gary, I, I was at a workshop this week, and uh, it had nothing to do with love, though. But afterwards, I, I invited her to go to lunch. And when we went to lunch, she's much, much younger than I am. Um, and uh, we, we got into this whole conversation of, um, of, of today's couples, like, and, and uh -huh. getting married. And we were, I was like, oh, back in the day, you know, if you weren't 21 and not married, it was amazing. And I like, like, look how many people are getting married in their 30s now. That just seems like, not that everybody is, but if you can see the trend and many yeah. people getting married and I was just telling her I have a wedding coming up April 10th that I'm the matron of honor for and uh you know and she's in her early 30s and this is this is yeah. the the trend we see now so maybe they know more than than the, you know like you said they the younger generation comes in at a higher vibration maybe they figure all of this out before they choose the one they want to walk down the aisle with who knows yeah well um Roman when do you think you're gonna get married how old are you now I'm 20 currently. I'll be 21 next month. Okay. So if you just had to guess when you're going to get married, when do you think that would be? Not anytime soon. Yeah. <laughs> I, have... I could not imagine any sort <laughs> of timeline, you... but I mean, I do would you... think it would be, like like Janine said, probably somewhere in my 30s. Yeah. And um, do you have any desire to get married? No. Yeah. That's pretty interesting. Well, there's, what's the benefit to it, really? 
you know. Exactly, I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but there was a benefit to it certainly 100 years ago. And, and culturally, there was a benefit to it 20 years ago. But, you know, Lily and I got married in 1999. We were going to have children. We didn't have to get married. But um, it was sort of the romantic thing to do. And, and having done that now, we really thought we would just live together and not be married. But it is, does give you a, you know, a commitment there to each other. And it's fun to say my wife and things like that. Right. But, well, uh, it also, it also provides, yeah, the, remember, there's also the biological element of it, which is the survival of the species. Well, that's which, not which, 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 was always, which was always a part of, which was always a part of the pairing off element to it. Yeah, that and someone, that, that someone right. would protect the, you know, the, the protection and raising of the offspring. Yeah. Also, you know, in terms of, you know, in terms of legal things, at least right now, mm-hmm. you know, there are protections for spouses, and especially that was especially important way back when, when women didn't have a lot of rights. Right. And it was designed for the protection of women to make sure that no matter what, that a man would take care of them, in, you know, financially, because women didn't work. When right. women didn't have the opportunities to work that they have today, yeah. You know, even though there still are glass ceilings, yeah, and that's fading away. And I'll, I'll bet you, in twenty years, the rights, the protections provided by marriage will also be provided by any long-term relationship. Well, the well, pay- it's very interesting you say that. You know, there are, you know, there is a, you know, a very nascent movement right now towards what are called polyamorous relationships. Mm-hmm. Yeah, where there are, you know, really, you know, which is basically a throwback to some degree to the polygamous relationships, but they're, but they're of all mixes, everything from, you know, everything from uh, same sex groups to other forms of, you know, to two women and a man or two men and a woman. And uh, the law today, you know, forgetting about religion, but the law today doesn't really know how to deal with it. And, you know, but there is that sort of movement away from the so-called traditional relationships. Yep. And we may be seeing something, you know, more likely Roman will see it uh, rather than uh, the rest of us. But uh, we may see a movement towards, uh, you know, a, towards groupings rather mm-hmm. than the traditional families or even same sex, to, you know, two you know, couples. Yeah. Well, we certainly today. same sex marriage is. It is um, t- being completely accepted now, and right, we'll and look that was un- and, that. That, and that was unthinkable twenty years right. ago. And twenty years from now, it'll be like, what was the big deal? Right, you know, right. So- in, in this ever-changing world, there's a lot of things that I think, and and uh, Michael, you're right in pointing that out. Roman's going to see a lot more in his lifetime than we did. I mean, look back in the day, people used to, you know, have arranged marriages, and they used to, you know, what was the family, what was the dowry she was going to get, mm-hmm. that type of thing. You know, I mean, you know, that's that's the thing. This is an ever-changing, and we're always constantly evolving. Well, we're right. evolving out of fear and into love, so we're cr- crossing that threshold. Right now, where people are thinking love thought before they think the fear thought for the first time in human history. And right. so you see things like polyamorous relationships coming up, and nobody, especially in, in uh, Roman's generation, thinks it's a big deal. Right. Although in the 60s, remember, there was in the a 60s, song by Stephen Stills, which was yeah. Love the One You're With. <laughs> right. And it was, that was like sort of the, the icebreaker there. And now it's moving more ma- mainstream out of a hippie culture into more of a mainstream stream culture. It's still, I guess, considered a little hippie-ish, but getting less so. Um, right. Roman, do you have friends that are polyamorous? No, I can't say that I do. Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, I guess maybe my, my friend group is not exactly the best cross-section of the, of the uh, young population here, but yeah. I mean, because we're pretty much, we're all just still in college, just out of high school. Yeah. So. Yep. <laughs> right. Okay, well, let's go on to the next paragraph. <clears throat> Okay. The only reason you fear the infidelity of a mate is because it is so difficult to find another who will choose to love you only for, I'm sorry, who will choose to love only you above all others. In a natural world where everyone is naturally free to love whoever they like, there would be no jealousy. How could there be? If the one you love chooses to love another, 
you would be overjoyed because you love that person. Love means acceptance. When you love in a natural world, you accept the ones you love unconditionally. Right. So if you're, when, when Joshua uses the word love, they tie it um, to the word acceptance. And that is what unconditional love is. It's unconditional acceptance. Um, because you love that person, they can do no wrong. Uh, you know, <laughs> Esther talks about her grandchild that if the grandchild burned down the house, she would think that somehow that was a good thing because <laughs> totally accepts the kid, hmm. you know. And, and this is sort of the love that we're striving for, that if you truly love somebody, that if, <clears throat> you know, if they did something that um, they wanted to do, you would accept that. Even the only reason you wouldn't accept it is because you had some sort of fear or you believed it was wrong, right? Uh, or that, you know, it's so hard to find someone else who's only going to love you, that sort of thing. Um, although, if, although if I were Esther, I would definitely keep that grandchild away from the matches. Or you'd have insurance. <laughs> 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 okay, so this is a paragraph that that um, a lot of people have would have an issue with. And Janine, we were talking about a little bit before, this is a paragraph that you don't agree with. Well, it's not, it's not necessarily don't agree with. I just like, for me, I, I have never been one to like think like and believe in soulmates. I think that a lot of us are very connected on a level. I also believe like in this lifetime, um, I know what I came here to do and it's teach and spread love. So I believe we can all love many, um, and right. as we should. And so, and I also totally agree with, um, uh, the, the discussion of moving towards fear and going towards love. You know, I just personally, it's my personal and it's a belief. It's not necessarily a fear more than it is a belief. As far as romantic love is concerned, if you choose to marry one person, and you don't have an agreement with your partner, either honor your commitment. I made that commitment in front of my family, my friends, and God. If you don't have that, that's quite all right. But just be honest with your, your partner and have an open relationship. That's your choice, your life, your journey. You know, right. this is my life, my journey. And, you know, my life affects so many people. What I do day in and day out affects my children as well. So, um, you know, it, we love, Tim and I love so many people, you know, um, we don't have a lot of jealousy in our relationship. And I'm, I'm happy and proud to say that there's really no room for jealousy. Um, we, re we recognize what people see in us and we recognize other people love us and we're okay with that. But as far as romantic love is concerned, that's just, you know, that's my belief system. Right. And it's, you know, well, everyone's entitled you, to their own. You know, I mean, certainly I, I'm with you on that too. Uh, and we don't live in a natural world. We live in a world that's th – th this is the world we live in. And maybe one day it will go to that. But, um, but if you just have that concept in the back of your mind that unconditional love means that whatever they do for their joy, then you, then you support that. And, and if you don't support it, it's only because you have some sort of fear in there. But certainly – you know, we want to keep our commitments to, to people and and that's above all in this society. And we're just, you know, uh, but maybe if, if there was some infidelity, it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. I really think that this this whole idea of a soulmate is kind of generated when someone finally reaches the point where they're not insecure anymore and they finally love themselves because then uh -huh. they find this relationship that they've, of course, attracted that is right. perfect in every way. And they're like, oh, my gosh this person is so special, but it's, it's not really that because when, when you're insecure and you're, you're fear-based, you're going to be attracting reasons to involve fear in your life, like jealousy or, or rage oh, or, you know, whatever, whatever it may be. So I find it kind of curious that the whole concept of a soulmate has, has been so much, uh, talked about in this question. Yeah. Uh, also you touched on it when you have that feeling of euphoria, it certainly seems like you're connected on a higher level. But um, what's really happening is that you're suspending fear long enough to feel how you're supposed to feel all the time anyway. Exactly. And, so and having that, a soulmate, it, it, right. doesn't, it doesn't mean anything. It could be anybody. It's just the it point where, where you have reached 
the point of of uh, loving everybody and everything. So it's, it's yeah. You've chosen yeah. to like suspend fear in this one little area enough so that you feel this euphoria that you should be feeling all the time. Um, and the, and you gave that person the object of your attention that ex, um, excuse or you know you you gave them the credit for how you feel. Exactly. When really, you allowed your feel, yourself to feel that way. Yeah, I think yep. it's funny that we, we kind of project everything onto something else, where it's right. really all, all development is internal. So it's like exactly. you got to yeah. look at look in the mirror sometimes. Right. Exactly. Roman, yeah. I think that's very insightful, especially for your age, you know, because <laughs> honestly, I tell that all, I say that all the time. It all begins with loving yourself first. How can you really give love and receive love if you can't love yourself? It's yeah, you have to start to there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, what do you mean? What do you mean, especially for his age? Remember, he's Steve two point oh. He's got a higher vibration right. here. He's way ahead of us. That's right. Let I me have... not forget that, Michael. Thanks for the reminder. I have a small head start. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's go on to the next paragraph. <laughs> there are no soulmates. Uh, you are is. a being of love, as is everyone you know. You are only masking your true identities out of fear. Without the presence of fear, you would love everyone you know. Some of those you might love romantically, and others you would simply love. Romantic love involves certain chemical functions having to do with breeding and the survival of the human race. However, love is love. Okay, let's go to the next one. Okay. Living in your society, you adopt certain beliefs about mating and the people you choose as your mates. You create preferences and desires, partly from personal experiences and partly from societal standards. You might choose a mate based on attributes you and or society feels are beneficial and appealing. However, most of your preferences are based on limiting beliefs about yourself and those you meet. You block yourself from finding a mate because your limiting beliefs are very strong. However, they are false. So Josh was talking specifically to Matt in this regard, but this paragraph really talks about us, um, all of us, um, who, you know, basically there are certain people you will not approach because you believe that they are out of your league. And they believe it too. So it's a two-way street. But mostly you believe it. So you limit yourself. So, the, you know, for me, when I was single, I was super confident. And there was nobody I ever met that I thought was out of my league, even though they may have thought it. But my confidence sort of masked, you know, it would fool them for a while. <laughs> you <know>? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really? You don't think Maybe. I'm good looking? I'm really good looking. Really? And they go, oh, maybe and, you are good looking. <laughs> and, 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 I w- and I was kind of the opposite. I, I joke around and I say there were two women in this world who ever paid attention to me and I married them both. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, you get to that point, don't you? I, I imagine. Yeah. Um, so... But uh, it really has to do with how you feel about yourself. You see this all the time. I mean, we, I had this friend. It was, he was a great guy. Um, and he would just go up. He'd go up to a group of girls at a bar who were sitting at a table or a restaurant, doesn't matter, and sit down with them, pull up a chair and sit down. And they would blow him off for 10 minutes. But he would just keep talking and talking and talking. And in 10 minutes, he'd win them all over. It was unbelievable, but that was the only thing he liked to do. So once that once he went him over, he'd leave and find some another group of girls. No, <laughs> but he was amazing. <laughs> he could talk to anyone, no fear whatsoever. Well, he must be an amazing salesman. What does he do for yeah. you? Yeah, I you know it's so interesting when you would see him because he must be a good salesman. But uh, he would just sit down, and the, it was so uncomfortable because the girls were like, "Who is this guy?" You know, they're trying to be polite, but they're trying to blow him off, you know. And he just would not leave. And we would just watch and cringe from a distance. Like, we could never do that. <laughs> and uh, but uh, it, and after a little while, they, they would just get talking, and they'd be, all be talking to him. So it, was, it all has to do with your confidence level. Right. Um, well, confidence any- <laughs> is contagious, and confidence is basically self-love. Confidence is totally self-love. That's right. Even if you fake it. Um, okay. I, you know, when I was first a waiter, um, I just pretended that I had been a waiter before and nobody knew the difference. That's, that's, you know, it was like, I just completely hid my fear 
and just went out there and did what I thought a waiter would do. And nobody else knew any different, so they all assumed I was a waiter and it worked out perfectly. And pretty soon I was a waiter. And I guess that you could do that with anything, I think. Maybe not back surgery, but... I, I, was, about, I was about to say, I don't think anyone <laughs> wants me as their surgeon today. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go to the next one. You got it. All limiting beliefs are based in fear and are therefore false. You have the ability to be, do, and have anything you want. The only thing holding you back is your decision to believe in your own self-imposed limitations. You are an unlimited being living in a limitless world. There are no limits placed upon you other than the ones you choose to erect. Remove the fear and your limitations will fall away. It is fear that shackles you to a life that is less than what you prefer. So in this instance, Josh was talking about love, but it could be the job you want friends, anything. Um, and the only thing keeping you from that is your limiting beliefs. Yeah, and I think that's true. Although I wish I knew how I could play guitar better. <laughs> um, yeah, My, I, I, have very stub, I have very stubby <laughs> fingers. <laughs> you know, if you, if you actually look, with certain exceptions, all the great guitarists in the world, Eric Clapton, the late Jimi Hendrix, whoever have tremendously long fingers. <laughs> right, so you need to give yourself examples of um, great guitar players with short fingers, and that will dissuade your limiting belief. So your limiting belief in this regard is holding you back as well. Yep. And you, and you believe it. You, know, you actually think it's a fact. Well, you, well, that's because I've seen the darn videos with Jimi Hendrix and Eric yeah. Clapton and, and Keith Richards and the other ones whose fingers fly across the board and, and the where they reason, stretch from one, you know, from like from the top to the bottom without any effort. <laughs> but the only reason you um, even saw those videos is because you were attracted by your limiting belief. It just supports your belief. Um, right. Now, if you take on the belief that there are great guitar players with shorter fingers, you will attract examples of that. And the more and more and more, and things will open up for you. Right, and it happens that there are. In fact, some of the great blues players didn't have great, in fact, some of them were missing fingers. Yeah, and um, so as you start to feel And they that, adapted. Yeah, that fingers um, may allow people to do it easier. They don't prevent you from playing guitar in your own style. And you can also say that every guitar player has their own style. Every guitar player is completely unique. And that you can hear the difference in, in the guitar players. Even though they're, they're basically playing the same songs, you can tell which person's playing which song. Yeah, no question. Yeah. Just so, like singers. So if you like playing guitar, you have the fingers that were perfect for you to play your style. And you wouldn't really want any other fingers because they'd be a different style. And that's so every everything is like this. You have these limiting beliefs that you believe are fact, and this these facts keep you from doing what the highest you know that you want to do. They're limiting, but they're not true. No limiting belief is ever true. And you just have to find yeah. the evidence to prove that they're not true. And once you do that, you'll start to uh, open up and reduce the intensity of it. So whether it's relationships or money or jobs or hobbies or uh, anything, you know, <clears throat> and you can always find evidence to support your beliefs, no matter what they're, whether they're lim limiting or beneficial. Yeah. So just keep that in mind. Right. Okay. You want to go into the next paragraph? Sure. We will say that the initial feeling you feel when in love is close to what we feel because in those early stages, you have not allowed fear to dip in and ruin it. The early stages of love are the times when you suspend fear and get a glimpse at what's, what it's like to live in the world without the feeling of fear. However, there is always a little fear mixed in there, and so it's not quite what we feel. We feel no fear in the non-physical. Keep going. So, yeah, no, well, uh, that, that's just, you know... Matt was asking, how does it, what do you guys feel when you're in the non-physical? And so if you, the feeling of euphoric love is what they feel, but it's more than that because there's uh, the absence of, of fear. So, um, so it's, 
it's a euphoric feeling, but more so than you can even imagine. I, <clears throat> in college, did um, acid once. My friend came to my house. From He was going to uh, Florida State, and I was still here in Boca, going to FAU. And so he came over. We got a six-pack of beer, played records, and did acid. And the feeling of love that I felt was just mind-blowing. It was like something I never experienced in my life. Towards him, my roommate, roommate Bruce came home later on in the evening. We were writing songs and drinking beer and listening to records. Just three of us in our apartment. And I was like, I cannot believe how much I feel love. And I still remember it to this day. It was unbelievable. Um, and I think that's sort of the glimpse of what it's like. Okay, so is this an ad now for feeding our heads? I don't know. It worked out for me. <laughs> I only did it once. I don't know why I never did it again. As you started talking about it, I started. Th- I, I keep on hearing song lyrics throughout this entire uh, this it entire was such podcast. A great feeling. And so this one was White Rabbit. Yeah. <laughs> um. So let's go to the last paragraph. You got it. There are other feelings that match how we feel as well. The feeling of exhilaration is present when you overcome fear. That is a good feeling. The feeling of relief is also another good feeling we feel here in the non-physical. Anytime you release fear, you feel what we feel here in the non-physical realm. We wish for you to feel as we do while you're here on Earth. Release a little fear, and you'll begin to see what we mean. Love others whether they love you or not. Don't concern yourself with how they choose to express or suppress their love. Simply choose to love, and the world will open itself to you. You are a magnificent being of love. Joshua. So that's true of all of us. Well, so there you have it. Love everyone. And you know what? And and that I was going to say that really does work because honestly, um, I. I just every day I, I set my intentions for the day. I pray. I do um, prayers of protection. I want myself to be a shining example of love and light. But at the same time, if anything were negative or whatever, I release it back out to the universe. Uh-huh. But I do say, let me be that shining light and that beacon and let me make someone someone's day that otherwise wouldn't have been nice. Um, a little more special. So whether it's sharing a smile or, you know, you meet somebody that's on the line at Publix and they're crotchety, you know, just to turn their day around, like you just, you go out there and spread love. And then the interesting thing is when you walk with your heart forward like that, it's amazing how many people come up to you. I took my son shopping two nights ago. He's like, mom, who doesn't talk to you? Who doesn't stop you? These people just keep coming. (laughs) And I'm like, it's just because they see what's beaming from the inside out. It's not the outwardly appearance as much as it is what's beaming from the inside out they can feel it they might be sensitive to energy they can feel it and they like what they feel and then they get you get involved in a conversation and then hey you know what who knows the other night um the second um store manager that i ended up you know she 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 saw me looking at like little crystals and whatever i was trying to find a a gift to take to my sister um when i see her out in la and she's like so we got into this whole she's like oh are you into this and then we got into the whole topic of law of attraction and then she's like oh where can i find the podcast and you know we just connect it and then she's just like you know i've seen you in here like four or five times and every time you come in here you just you know i try to tell people you know, when my employees get like, oh, that one was a real, you know, nasty person or, oh, she was bitchy or whatever to customers, then look, there's someone like her that walks in and, you know, this is where your focus should be. The other ones just let them go on their way. I said, that's what I do. If someone's like, if someone's like, um, you know, their demeanor is, you know, something that's not resonating with me, I just bless them on their way, you know, but I still smile at them and let them go. Because where is that going to get us if we let it internally bother us and ruin our day? Nowhere. Well, plus you're um, attracting what you're putting out. So if you're putting out love, you're attracting love in return. Right. And, but you can also, you know, I used to come across drivers that were really annoying and I would let it bother me and I would say, they're wrong, and they should not be doing this. And I would give them the evil eye and stuff and honk or whatever. And now I'm like, everything is right. Everyone is doing anything is right. I'm just going to go around it. It's no big deal to me. And 
and really suddenly driving is completely different than it ever was before. Isn't that amazing? Like, right. uh, like I was at a hospital um, waiting for a parking spot. I had my blinker on. I was ready to turn in, and someone just whipped in front of me and went in. And yeah. then I just like looked at him, and he's like, "Uh," and I'm like, "No." And then he like literally felt so bad. I'm like, "Thank you." You know, I have. You know, I'm I'm capable of walking. I will go yeah. to the back of the lot. I yeah. will find something. Absolutely, you need at that spot, and you should have it. Oh no, I insist. I back out for you. I'm like, no, thank you. I'm I'm <laughs> perfectly fine. You felt you needed it, and so it is. Have it. You know. Um, but you know what? You just you know. Uh, those are the kind of situations, Gary, where in my past, I'm not saying I might have honked the horn and I might have been like, hey, I was waiting here, you know. Right. Well, where, I would have right. yeah. Yeah, and I'm yeah. telling you, in my past, I would have done that. But now, the last handful of years, now I don't. You know what? Yeah. That spot wasn't meant for me. And if they really needed it that badly, maybe they, maybe the person they're going to see, it's some sort of emergency. Sure. I'm, I'm okay. Possible. I'm capable. Yeah. Mm-hmm, and I can walk. So. Yeah. And that approach, right. really, when you take that approach where – um, I am so glad that I can walk. I don't need to use a handicapped spot. I don't even care if it's up front. You know, I, I'm so appreciative of just being able to walk. Well, all of a sudden now, the front rows always open up for me. I mean, the, the really two, two big thing examples of the lot of traction working are these parking spots in the middle, I mean, the big, in the front of the lots, opening always now, and seeing numbers line up. One 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 two 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 three two three, mm-hmm. stuff like that. I see that. I see one 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 all the time. But the other thing is the same, very same thing happens to me, Gary. Those spots just open up, and I just say thank you, angels, because right. <laughs> it right. happens all the time. More I've times. I've other than people not. say this too. Yeah, that Absolutely. when you're when you're getting on this new approach to life, um, understanding law of attraction, the first things that happen are that synchronicity of numbers, and these parking spots opening up. Mm-hmm. You know. And, and that parking spot that, that 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 gentleman darted in front of me, honestly, it was the very first parking spot near the entrance. It just so happened that they were pulling out, and the, the lady smiled at me, and I was like, hey, and I put my blinker on to move in, and it yeah. came up the other way, but quite a right. And guess what? As packed as that was, because there's like standing room only in that lot, I uh-huh. found it right away. Yeah. Yes, it was a little right. further back, but yes, it was a beautiful day, and I was capable of walking, so there you go. And you know what? You, you've changed that guy's demeanor more by doing that than by being mad at him right you know because by expressing your love he really had to rethink his whole approach now i agree i agree wholeheartedly yes so interesting yeah i mean my my kids make fun of me especially my son that i make friends wherever i go you know we're out to get we're out as a family and i'll start striking up conversations with people and I'll hear my son whisper to my wife, and she'll go, and he'll go, "Dad made another friend." But it, you know, it's like he's a little like they're a little embarrassed. Yeah, you know, and it's funny because <laughs> this outward expression of love makes people uncomfortable sometimes, because I think people are more used to um, people being maybe a uh, aloof or not as responsive. I mean. I had a really good friend, Greg, who's since moved away, but he would go and talk to anybody, and he didn't care, and he loved talking to people. Um, and I was just like, really? You're just making friends everywhere? But people love that guy. Which is, so that's a good approach That's life. funny. I, I remember when I lived up north, I used to commute into Manhattan every day, and I took the, uh, the, the bus through, you know, go through the tunnel to Port Authority. Yeah. And I would meet so many people, and other people were like, like and, and, and honestly, not only did I meet them going, but I meet them coming back. And, you know, um, Michael, I'm sure you know from being in New York City, you know, when you're in New York City, you look like forward, you just mind your own business, walk your pace. It's like everybody's right. not smiling at everybody like they are <laughs> down here. They would think something's wrong with you. Right. So right. I remember um, there was this really bad snowstorm and the bus took like, oh, I had to take us over four hours to get home. And uh, so the, I happened to meet this couple on the bus and turns out they both worked independent places in the city, but they were married and they lived in our same building. This is like the very first year, a couple months after Tim and I got married. And um, so so I remember that um, 
you know, Tim was home and I knew dinner was ready and the whole thing. So I come to the door and I introduce, I'm like walking in the door to our apartment. I had an apartment at the time and I'm like, Tim, I'd like to introduce you to the, and I'm like, oh, they're going to join us for dinner tonight. You have enough, right? Because they, you know, <laughs> the poor things they would have never ate. It was already so late, but they're like, and everybody reminds me of that. Like I'll meet. And t- so then after that, it became a joke. It's like, oh, who are you going to meet? Who are you going to bring home today? You know, <laughs> so, that's wonderful. Yeah. That's, that's great. Yeah, like I said, my kids, my family makes fun that I do things like that too. But you know what? I've actually met, you know, there are also a lot of people who are, you know, who already are like that and who are looking for that connection. You know, I've spoke, I've had the pleasure of speaking to so many nice people on, you know, on Metro North, which is, you know, how I get to and from New York City. I've met people on the, you know, met people on the streets. Often they're the homeless people who are, you know, who are craving conversation as much as craving the money or the food. Wow, just connection. You know, they're, they, you know, I always ask them their names because people, you know, people too often will hand them money or hand them something or more, more, more often than not walk by them. Without but a lot looking. of times that, yeah. you know, they're really looking to be acknowledged as human beings again. Oh, that's nice, Michael. I like to yeah. hear stories like that. You know, so, you know, more than just the dollar I stick in their cup, they're more, you know, they're actually more excited to be, you know, that someone actually acknowledged their existence. So if we think more about love to the ones we love, our wives and girlfriends and husbands, um, and, and we think more about Joshua's talking about acceptance. So I think for this Valentine's, I'm going to think about you know, how much I appreciate Lily and that nothing that she can do can get me upset, which is sort of how it is now. It used to be not that way. But now it's, it's getting more and more of an acceptance, which is sort of building to this more deeper love that somehow doesn't have that same feeling of when we first were dating, but it's just like deeper. I wonder how come that changes, that feeling from, you know, you just romantic, passionate, um, euphoric, fun. I mean, we still have a lot of fun. And, uh, but it's a completely different feeling of love now. Well, in part, it's probably because of your, because of your spiritual orientation now. Yeah. But, um, now I'm like much more appreciative of everything too. It was in, you know, when we were first dating, we were like this euphoric head over heels in love. And then we quickly got into a, a, you know, a, uh, monogamous live in relationship. Then we got married and now it's been 16 years since we've been married. Um, and, but we fought a lot in the beginning. Uh, just you know, sort of like battles for power. Um, and then since we've been really meditating and in to, to uh, uh, Abraham and now Joshua, we've both come together so close. You know, and we've always been a real good team, but now we're like, we're just like one unit almost. Um, but it's a different feeling completely. Yeah, and your love evolves and it becomes stronger. Yeah. I mean, I can speak from experience too because in May, um, Tim and I are going to be married 30 years. And 30 we'll years, wow. Yeah, Whoa. 35. And um, I have to tell you, we still have so much fun together. Yeah, so much you guys fun. Do. Yeah, and like a lot of our friends are like, what do you guys do? How do you, yeah. you know, they want to know how do you keep it fresh? How do you keep it like, you know, and, and a lot of people are like, if I could have a relationship like that, you know, they kind of look up to us. Um, we're not looking for anyone to look up to us. We're just living our existence and our, uh, you know, in our lives. But yeah. um, Well, you're an example you know, of that. Yeah. When I look at right. my couples, like you um, two are having fun together. Deborah, Joe, and Frank are having so much fun together. Me and Lily are having fun together. Peter and his wife are having fun together. Um, and then I have uh, couples um, that you can see that one is wanting the other one to be different than they are. And they're trying to coerce the other into being something that they want them to be. And they're not having fun. So it, I can f- easily see that the couples are having fun are the ones who are accepting of each other exactly as they are. And the ones who are not having fun are the ones who want the other person to be different than they are. 
I agree wholeheartedly. Yep. And you know, it's also too to add upon that, Gary, because I agree 100% with what you said. I think that, you know, we're also we're also confident in our relationships. So um, we allow the other person um, to express themselves to follow their passion, their interests, right. we don't try to stifle them. You know, that really comes out of fear and jealousy when you do that. You know, yeah. it, fear, other, exactly. you, you now, I think it's important, though, for couples to have common interest as well. And, mm-hmm. and as we do, and I know you and Lily do, um, you know, it's great to have common interest, but it's also it's OK to let that other person be who they are and have their own experience as well. And at the end of the day, you're coming together as a couple anyway. So um, it's it's a delicate blend, but it's a blend. And um, I, you know, I I couldn't I couldn't agree with you more on that. Yeah. Right. There has to be the, you know, there has to be that combination of the independence and yet the, uh, you know, the things that you have in common, you know, where you have a common interest and common fun. It's so interesting that the guys I'm, I play poker with, they're like, how can you be married um, and be here playing poker? Because all their wives hate them doing that and think it's a total waste of, of time and, and that sort of thing. And it's because the wives don't really have their own thing going on. They want the husband to be home or whatever. Um, of course, there's those guys that the wife wants to be out of the house, too. There's that aspect as well. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, because Lily has so much going on on her own, it, um, it just works out perfectly. I always send t- – like, I would, I would, Gary, the last poker party I went to with um, – that you were at it was a lot of couples came actually and so many of them were like wow that's amazing i'm like i sent yeah go have fun do your thing yeah. i'm doing my thing you know um as well and you know but that doesn't mean i so if he plays friday night saturday night we go out you know yeah. it, I just let him to, if you stifle someone and don't let them be who they want to be and do what they want to do, then really, uh, you know, you have to reevaluate your relationship because, uh, you know, you can't stifle someone. When you well, stifle them, they're not happy. And right. again, that's, that's getting them to, you know, trying to coerce them into being who, want, who you think they should be being instead of who they are, who they are being. Right. And then I take a common, I, I mean, I take a real interest in knowing I can't wait to, to for, he'll call me on break and he'll tell me what's going on mm-hmm. or how he's doing or he'll picture yep. text me his chips or yep. you know um uh, you know he'll say oh this is what happened and then my my middle son's really in, like getting into poker it's just it's a new it's a new hobby for him so they'll like I'll listen to them talk about it when he gets home too um because I don't pretend to know all your terminology and you know <laughs> as is the same for me if I went out you know for drinks and to the movies with my girlfriends or something he'll say oh what did you see what did you think about it so we really take an interest in and what the other one's doing, yet we allow us to 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 explore that on our own, you know. Well, we're about to hit fifty-seven minutes. We're okay, 50, guys, 60. that's about. Yep. It. We're gonna wrap this one up. Uh, this was a really fun topic. Love. Who doesn't love love? <laughs> love is all there is. We're lucky that or we love have love is all you need. In the words yep. of the Beatles, <laughs> that's true. And um, so. If you want to read along with these quotes and these questions of the week, um, just go to the website at theteachingsofjoshua.com, sign up for the newsletter, it comes every Saturday, and you can read along with us, plus there's plenty of other stuff to look up, look on the uh, website, and of course, anytime you like, you can simply ask Joshua a question, and maybe we'll use one of your questions one of these weeks. Until next week, you guys have a wonderful Valentine's, have a great rest of the week, and we'll see you again next Saturday. And we Thanks. love all of you guys who are listening. And we love yeah. each other. We yeah. love everybody. Happy Valentine's Day and go out there and spread some love. Good luck. <laughs> okay. Bye now. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to the Teachings of Joshua Roundtable with Gary Temple Bodley. We will be back next week with another fun discussion. If you would like to ask Joshua a question or read more of Joshua's teachings, please visit us at theteachingsofjoshua.com. See you next week.